Well, hello, it's the last day of January. It's Saturday. I'm Bill Olson, and this is Free Speech Zone. We're going to uh, start out today with some of the photos I just took. It's a new feature. I forgot to do it last week, but uh, went up to a, a place here in Portland called Rocky Butte and uh, took some pictures when there was some fog on the lower lying out outlying areas. Go ahead and put that picture up. Yeah, that was the, the first thing I saw. No fog at all when I got there. This was about, oh, just before 7 in the morning. Sunrise, supposedly about 7.35. Go ahead and show the next one. Just step through these. Yeah, this is St. Helens and Mount Rainier in the background, and there's the 205 freeway sinking into the fog. Go ahead and next one. Yeah, same thing, a little bit different view. Step back. Go ahead. That's Camus, basically, towards Camus. The, the fog's rolling in now. Go ahead and keep, keep stepping through. You can see the light of Rocky Butte there. Yeah, now this is a, a great shot. You don't have to have a mountain to have a good shot, and fog sometimes makes beautiful photography. Go ahead and step through it again. Yeah, this is just trees. Trees and fog, but it's really beautiful. But wait till, yeah, here we go. Now, I was planning to put the tree in the way of the sun so I could, you know, get more photons from the surrounding area. But I didn't count on the fog actually rising up to my level just as the sun rose. And you can see that the tree is casting a shadow on the fog. One of the most incredibly beautiful pictures just by accident of being there right when it happened. So go ahead and let's take a look at a couple of these. That's another example. Pretty incredible. It changes just as fast as you pull the trigger on the camera. It's amazing. So anyway, this is what you live for. Life is what you live for. Connect with nature every day. This is why we have to be political. That, right after that, the sun set the same day. I went to uh, a local wetland area and just started taking pictures of the wildlife there. Just go ahead and step through these. Mallards and, and the ones with the long beaks, these guys are called northern shovelers. I'm not an Audubon member or a, or a nut, but I think I'll join Audubon Society. But I, I don't really know much about these animals, but I sure like their taking their pictures. <laughs> the sun makes for really excellent illumination when it's really a low angle. And of course, the colors are spectacular. There's the male version of the northern shoveler. Okay, well, let's get on with it here. Uh, yeah, now we have to get down to serious stuff. Well. Manufactured terrorism, manufactured terror. We're going to listen to Abby Martin on this subject. This will be about a little longer than eight and a half minutes, something like that. Go ahead and run it. What is happening, folks? I'm Abby Martin, and this is Breaking the Set. So last week, according to the corporate media, the FBI had one of its most successful counterterrorism operations to date. See, the Bureau says it was tracking 20-year-old Ohio man Christopher Cornell for at least eight months and last week stopped his ISIS-inspired plot to bomb the Capitol and kill government officials through one of their informants. Except just a few things don't add up. For one, Cornell has no history of politically motivated violence, only converted to Islam a few months ago, and according to his pops, is a mama's boy who acted like a 16-year-old and never left the house. He further claims that his son only had $1,200 in his bank account, not nearly enough to purchase all the weapons and ammo that the FBI caught him with. Listen, we still know very little concerning the evidence against Cornell, but given the history of the FBI's use of contrived terror plots, we should all be very skeptical of this story. Consider the 2011 case of a Muslim convert named James Chromatai, who repeatedly refused an FBI informant's attempt to force him and three others to shoot down military planes in New York. He only agreed to carry out the plot after the informant offered him a quarter million dollars, leading the judge who presided over the case to state that the government, quote, manufactured the crimes that Chromatai was convicted of. 
Over the summer, Human Rights Watch documented at least 27 other examples of coercive entrapment tactics that the FBI has used against Muslims in these same types of stings. As journalist Glenn Greenwald says, having crazed loners get guns and seek to shoot people is of course a threat, but so is allowing the FBI to manufacture terror plots and the process keeping fear levels about terrorism inflated along with its own surveillance powers and budget. And given the media's no questions asked approach to reporting the story, you can bet that no questions will be asked when the FBI's next round of funding comes up. Now let's break the set. Another day, another deployment of troops to the Middle East to fight America's endless and futile war against terrorism. This week, the Pentagon announced the U.S. will send at least 500 troops in countries surrounding Syria in order to train more, quote, moderate opposition fighters in the country. These rebel trainers will be sent in addition to the 3,100 troops already set to train and advise forces in Iraq. According to the DOD, 5,000 moderate rebels can be trained in the first year. Yet 15,000 are needed in order to retake the parts of Syria under ISIS control. But interestingly enough, U.S. military involvement in Syria wasn't always about fighting ISIS. And in fact, two years ago, before ISIS was on the map, the government was already funding moderate rebels with one very clear goal, to oust Bashar al-Assad. And Kerry's own words, Mr. Assad is out of time and must be out of power after meeting here with Mwaz al-Khatib, the leader of the Syrian opposition coalition back in 2013. Let's not forget the Obama administration was perfectly poised to bomb Syria for crossing an invisible red line around that same time, but was forced to back down due to pressure. Enter ISIS, a group terrorizing civilians from Iraq to Syria and giving the U.S. the perfect pretext to bomb both countries. And despite the campaign being described as a coalition of the willing of more than 40 nations, nearly 97% of the 62 strikes in the first half of December alone were carried out by the U.S. Since that time, Obama has had little opposition, pushing through measures granting hundreds of millions of dollars to train more rebels, including 500 million just last year. So how is it possible to vet militias and make sure weapons aren't getting into the wrong hands? Considering how these dudes are probably not going to be wearing badges displaying the fact that they're extremists, like this guy right here. Don't worry though, the Pentagon is just as concerned, guys. That's why they're tracing the arms through a series of handwritten invoices and are conducting psychological evaluations and stress tests on potential warriors. One can only imagine what kind of questions will be featured on such a test. Maybe, how would you describe yourself? A, moderate, B, extremist, or C, undecided? Or, are you with us or against us? Yes or no? Or, do you root for the destruction of America? Or, who would you rather have a beer with, Assad or Obama? Truthfully, it's nearly impossible to find on the ground fighters in Syria who don't have ties to extremists or are more willing to take on ISIS than their main opponent, Assad. Senator John McCain, a man who loves to gallivant around the world and help foment revolution in Ukraine, Iran, and Syria, was featured with alleged kidnappers on an embarrassing photograph circulated by the media, which claimed it was members of ISIS. But the truth is much murkier. Here he is hanging out with rebel fighters in Syria, including Mwaz Mustafa, who heads essentially a privatized arm of the CIA called the Syrian Emergency Task Force, as well as Mohammed Noor and Abu Ibrahim, two men identified by Lebanese press as kidnappers of 11, 11 Lebanese Shiite pilgrims. When confronted about the PR push, McCain's spokesperson said it would be, quote, unfortunate if the rebels turned out to be kidnappers. Beyond McCain's senility, though, vetting extremists anywhere is insane. In fact, one anonymous former CIA vetting expert told Newsweek, to be really honest, very few people know how to vet well. It's a very specialized skill. It's extremely difficult to do well in the best of circumstances. 
It's not like there's a recruiting table set up in the desert. Instead, trust is put into the hands of local tribal leaders or sources within the Free Syrian Army who in turn recruit their fighters. Once the source is asked if they can find an army they can trust, which they always say yes to, that's when the cash and weapons start flowing. Problem is that very often these guys straight up lie and use their resources to switch sides, smuggle drugs and arms, or even fight back against the U.S. According to Newsweek, a particularly vivid example was provided recently by Peter Theo Curtis, an American held hostage in Syria for two years. A U.S.-backed Free Syrian Army unit that briefly held him hostage casually revealed how it collaborated with al-Qaeda's al-Nusra front, even after being vetted and trained by the CIA. Look, this isn't the first time the U.S. has funded what it claims to be moderate rebels to fight against unsavory leaders. And unfortunately, every single time it's backfired and caused horrible blowback. Look no further than the partnering with Osama bin Laden and the Mujahideen, America's greatest ally in the fight against the Soviets back in the 80s. Of course, that only gave birth to the Taliban. Or Libya in 2011, where assisting so-called freedom fighters against Muammar Gaddafi left the country in ruins, paving the way for an extremist safe haven. See, once the bad guys are dead, the U.S. looks the other way, leaving these countries governmentless and chock full of guns. 200,000 civilians have lost their lives in the bloody Syrian civil war. A civil war where horrific war crimes have been committed on both sides and millions of people have been left as refugees from the violence. Opposing state funding of Assad doesn't make you a Western stooge. And opposing Western military intervention in the country doesn't make you an Assad apologist. Rejecting the military mindset just means you're someone who's heeded the lessons of history and refuses to be complicit in its repetition. Okay, uh, well, now back on the home front. I mean, we're manufacturing terror everywhere, but in the, we're also implementing, deliberately implementing, uh, police state oppression on all fronts. The whole idea, combining with the terrorism and combining with the police harassment and pat downs and all that sort of thing, be very afraid. Be very, very afraid. Well, I'm not going to be afraid, sorry. And if you want to actually resist everything, don't be afraid. Live your life normally and be outraged when somebody interferes with your legal and lawful rights. So anyway, when the tables are turned, you know, we have all this surveillance on us, but when the tables are turned, the police cry bloody murder. Here's a story about an app that people are using to monitor the police. Poor Google. All they want to do is make their technology products and in return make enough money to own the solar system. But the problem is, they're so good at making stuff that all the bad people keep using their products for nefarious purposes. And then Google has to answer to that. It's a tough situation for the tech giant, and it keeps getting worse. Now they've got a new dilemma on their hands, and as usual, it's filled with irony. In 2013, Google bought the app called Waze, which is a sort of combination between GPS and social networking. It has 50 million users in 200 countries who use Waze to report traffic stuff, like accidents, congestion, potholes, construction, poor weather, those kinds of things, so that other users can get real-time traffic information. But users also report where police are by plopping down police icons if they see a speed trap, sobriety check, or just an officer in a coffee shop. And that's making law enforcement worried that the app is now being used to stalk the police. To the point where Los Angeles Police Chief Charlie Beck has now formally complained in a letter to Google asking them to disable the police tracking feature on Waze. And in fact, according to Beck, the guy who recently killed two NYPD officers actually included a screenshot from Waze in his threatening messages to the police. 
And other officers around the country are pointing the finger at Waze, too, saying it's only a matter of time before we see more cases of police haters using the app to hunt down and harm officers. And there are so many police haters right now. For its part, Google declined to comment on the issue to the Associated Press, but Way's spokesperson, Julie Mossler, did respond, and she's the one who brought the irony. Because she said that Waze helps keep everyone safe through how much information it shares with police about its users. That's because Waze users keep their apps on and are therefore really easy to track. And that law enforcement really likes about Waze. In fact, we all know law enforcement and the government like a lot of Google's technology, as they've constantly forced the company to cough up information. The NSA broke into Google's communication lines, and just recently the government used a secret warrant to force Google to hand over emails from WikiLeaks employees. So, law enforcement wants to use Waze to track individuals, but they want to force Google to stop letting individuals track law enforcement back. Poor Google. Maybe if we all just vote for Google for president in 2016, they'd put an end to law enforcement using our information against us once and for all. And they'd ensure our information would be used for what it's really meant for, which is getting us to be non-thinking bots who buy stuff we don't need through contextual advertising. Tonight, let's talk about that. Yeah, she nailed it. A non-thinking bot. I want to buy, 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 consume. What do we do after 9-11? What's the best thing we can do to fight terrorism? Go shopping! Yeah, okay. No, okay, but back to the thing. The police don't want you to track them. But when do you see policemen in their worst role? It's when somebody is exercising their legal right to assemble and protest expressing a grievance peacefully. Now, in these peaceful demonstrations, when does the violence begin? Why, as soon as the police start it every single time. Because, remember, the police, it, their job, the whole reason that there is a police force is to protect the moneyed class from you and me. And when people protest, when people in the poorer classes protest the treatment given to them by the richer classes, they are immediately put down by the police. That's why that happens. That's why you see policemen going after unions. That's why you see policemen going after anti-war protesters. That's why you see policemen going after you. So here's another thing. The police wear all this body armor. Well, what would happen if you started buying body armor? Now, body armor can't hurt anybody else. So, you know, the justification that the police use all the time when they do things is, is for public safety. Of course, that's very similar to the national security dodge that the uh, intelligence people use. Well, uh, it, there's a bill in Congress now to, uh, that might make me a criminal because I'm a contractor, a former contractor, and look at this. Okay, I got one of my boots here, just an old contractor boot, but I got metatarsal support here, and it's got a, a steel toe, and it's got a steel shank down here to prevent me from stepping on nails and having it go through my foot. Now, I wear this all the time. It just protects my feet. At one point, I was carrying a pallet a long time ago when I didn't have these, and it fell right there and broke one of my metatarsals. I never wore anything else around any work I was doing. <clears throat> but if I wear this to a protest, I could be arrested under this new law. Go ahead and roll it. We're going to take a look at this. Back again, it's called the Responsible Body Armor Possession Act, and it specifically bans the purchase, ownership, or possession of enhanced body armor by civilians. So the big question here is what exactly constitutes enhanced body armor? Well, according to the bill, this is armor that meets or exceeds the ballistic performance of Type 3 equipment. Type 3 provides the highest level of protection currently available, so this would safeguard you against rifle rounds uh, as well as some handguns. Just to give you an idea, a few of the things that would be banned here include military-grade helmets, ballistic vests, and of course, shields. If this bill goes through, all of these will be off the table. But there are a few exceptions, groups of people that would be completely exempt from this legislation. And that includes all personnel who work for the government and various agencies and local law enforcement. 
But the group that is notice, noticeably absent from that exemption list are journalists. And while most of this equipment is typically purchased for reporting in war zones abroad, it's increasingly being purchased in the U.S., especially in the event of major protests and rioting in places like Ferguson, Missouri. In fact, in the aftermath of that incident, RT had to invest in some of that very equipment like this right here, this helmet and bulletproof vest, which is at that type three level. Some journalists are concerned about how this would limit them in that capacity, but other civilians are worried about how this could impede the right to protect themselves, especially with local police departments now becoming even more militarized around the country, beefing up their weapon arsenal through programs like the DOD's 1033. And it's those concerns that will likely come up as points of criticism as this bill continues on for debate in Congress. Reporting in Washington, Amira David, RT. See, I okay, so, you, you know, I guess you could argue that if there was some group that armed itself like an army and put on body armor and that tried to attack the police. Well, at that point, they're fighting a war. They're not, uh, they don't get to, you know, laws don't really matter at that point. They're gonna deal with it. The idea that, that you need a law like this is kind of ridiculous. It doesn't do anything except allow a prosecution at random, indiscriminate, or let's say capricious and arbitrary prosecution based on, you know, somebody's defining what you're wearing it's it's incredible that you could be in trouble for wearing a bulletproof vest to a protest where most of the things that are being shot are being shot by the police why don't we have the right to protect ourselves you know there here's an, a perfect example of this a Seattle professor was attending a protest and he was leaving the protest on the sidewalk he's talking on the phone and he got pepper sprayed go ahead and play this one is a half a million dollar lawsuit after city police pepper sprayed a man as he quietly walked away from attending a rally talking on the phone. The demonstration he'd been taking part in focused on human rights and racial discrimination in the US. The pepper spray victim was school teacher Jesse Hagapian, one of around a thousand activists who joined the event. He described what happened. I was part of a demonstration that occurred on Martin Luther King Day um, to celebrate the life of a man who created great change in our country and stood for racial and social justice. And I had the wonderful opportunity to give the final speech. I spoke about how Dr. King would be in the streets demanding justice for Mike Brown, for Eric Garner, and so many other black people whose lives have been so callously cast away. And it wasn't too long after I delivered that speech that I was pepper sprayed uh, while on the sidewalk, talking actually with my mother on the phone who was coming to pick me up to go to my two-year-old's birthday party. Well, the rally in Seattle was part of a nationwide wave of protest in the United States held under the uh, banner Black Lives Matter. It gained momentum after the deaths of Eric Garner and Michael Brown. Garner died after a policeman put him in a fatal chokehold while trying to arrest him. His last words were, I can't breathe, which became another campaign slogan, while Michael Brown was an unarmed 18-year-old African-American shot dead by police last August. Yeah, here at Portland Community Media on the blackboard in the lunchroom, somebody wrote up the names of the cops that killed the latest two or three black people and said, arrest them, black lives matter. Okay, I have no dispute with that. But I wrote underneath it, arrest Bush times three, Cheney, Clinton times two, and then underneath that I wrote, war crimes matter. Okay, well, war crimes do matter. And you can strike back, even if you're in the military. Now, the Israeli military is absolutely as corrupt as ours is. In fact, I think they teach each other new tricks. Uh, and by the way, there's a new book out about the formation of Israel, describing how the Zionists contaminated our Congress in 1948 and manipulated our legal process to, to form this peculiar situation where the United States 
is involved in the Israeli-Palestine conflict supporting the bad guy, supporting Israel. Okay, well, anyway, here's a, a, an uplifting story. A couple of Israeli soldiers got fired because they told their boss that they didn't mind protecting Israel, but they weren't going to participate in the illegal occupation of another country. Let's play this one. Been sacked for refusing to conduct further intelligence missions in the West Bank. The 43 former staff were told they'd committed a grave breach of military conduct after writing a joint letter to Prime Minister Netanyahu. That letter says that the intelligence they were gathering in the West Bank was harming civilians and being used for political persecution, and that they were therefore incapable of continuing to serve the system. Well, after the military sacked those reservists, RT asked the group for comment. They went on to tell us they believe commanders are trying to make the issues they're raising go away simply by firing them. Let's get reaction now from Dr. Yishe Minyachin, the uh, Executive Director of the Public Committee Against Torture in Israel. Doctor, thanks for being with us. This. These officers say um, they didn't want to take part in the deepening military rule, as they put it, in Palestinian lands. How legitimate are their concerns? Look, uh, the occupation is more than 47 years old. Uh, thousands of Israeli soldiers are refusing every year to take part in it. It was important that it was the first time of this elite intelligence unit uh, members say enough is enough. We are not willing to take part in it because all this issue of occupation and ongoing repression of Palestinians have no political end. Everything uh, that is said, it say we are willing to defend Israel but are not willing to continue with occupation and uh, repression duties. They refuse just to start to continue listening to Palestinian telephones or Palestinian uh, other kind of media and communication tools and to report about issues like homosexuality, like about a financial problem, etc., that are used by the Israeli security agency to blackmail these Palestinians to force them to work for Israel. They say enough is enough. We don't we are not willing to take part in it anymore. Well, for raising their concerns, they got the sack, albeit they were reservists, but seasoned some of them long-serving um, uh, reservists and um, uh, military people. Was that a fair response from the Israeli military, do you think, to sack them because of their concerns? Look, the reserve soldier, I mean, it's very nice when you, you are not going to be called because you are not going to be taken a month, a year, to serve, it's fine, it's okay, and I think it's stupid because when you look at the numbers of soldiers entering into the Israeli army, we know nowadays that at least half of the cohort is not willing to take part in service. So to take 43 in a unit that, uh, let's say, thousands are serving there and saying, we are going to punish you because you are, say that you have problem with the morality of this unit is, it's not really going to harm the unit. Mm. And for these people, they will not have to go a month, a year to serve the state. They will find better things to do. Israel regularly struggles to fill its um, needs for uh, you know, soldiers, etc. Uh, are we going to see more people coming out doing this kind of thing, going public about what they think, for whatever reason, whether it's because they want to continue to serve or not? This is not the first time uh, that refusal was on the map of Israel. In 82, I was a member of a group of 3,500 soldiers that refused to go to Lebanon, and I've spent time in prison for that. Every year since uh, 2000, uh, sorry, since 1982, there are hundreds of soldiers every year that are refusing to take part. Uh, the media doesn't cover it, only when there is smart some special group of 12 pilots, 43 intelligence uh, uh, personnel, uh, people from a special elite units that are writing something about it. But every year, thousands of soldiers are not willing to enter the army or refuse to continue. And would you say that situation is getting worse or better with regarding recruitment? 
I think that it became worse because more and more people fed up with the occupation, don't want to spend every year a month. And uh, I'm talking with a lot of my colleagues. I'm a major. I was a major in the Israeli Defense Forces. And many of my friends, many years before, uh, uh, I mean, before the, the official a day that they should leave the army at the age of 42 or 46 for officer left i mean most of us fed up we don't want to continue to 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 check other people to enter into civilian neighborhoods to take part in things that we evaluate as a war crime so we are not willing to take part it's famous now because as i say 43 a soldier of a light unit of intelligence say, enough is enough. But more and more Israeli soldiers say, enough is enough. We are not willing to take part in the pressure. Dr. Yeshua Mnuchin, thanks for your insight. Thanks for being live on RT International. Nice to see you today. Okay, now American news, sensing they're losing the information war battle, has now declared that RT is one of the things that they have to deal with. It's one of the problems that we have in this country is trying to deal with terrorist sources like ISIS and that Boko Haram or whatever that is, and somebody that's just like those guys, Russia Today. Yeah, R Russia Today is just like those guys. Uh, I, I was discussing with one of my technicians uh, that very fact, and I said, except that RT doesn't kill anybody, and he countered far better than that. He turned around and he says, no, there's a better reason. What? What's that? He says, they don't work for the U.S. like ISIS does. Ooh, okay. So, but isn't it funny that with all the news agencies and, and all their touted glory in this country, we can't get news that matters to us? We have to go to the propaganda source to get news that matters. Isn't that, uh, I can't believe it. Well, let's go get some more news. We have a problem with American exceptionalism. How do you view America's role in the world? Well, of course, we're fighting against terrorism in the Middle East. You know, seven different wars at once. Seven. <laughs> How about, did you know that last year we sent our special ops troops to 133 countries. Play this clip. They're called commandos, SEALs, Green Berets, Delta Force. We're talking about America's special ops forces. With a joint total of around 60,000 active duty soldiers from all branches of the military and operating under the U.S. Special Operations Command, perhaps more widely known as U.S. SOCOM, this broad band of highly, specially trained commandos operate stealthily around the world without much fanfare. In fact, during the 2014 fiscal year, SOCOM deployed special ops forces to 133 countries across the globe. That's roughly 70% of the entire world and certainly every region of it. Special ops forces are well known as the cream of the crop in America's armed forces. They're highly skilled soldiers and academics alike. Now, the capacity of their deployments would vary from time-sensitive rescue missions executed with surgical precision in the middle of the night to taking out some of the world's most dangerous terrorists, like Osama bin Laden, for example. That one drew media attention to SEAL Team 6 like never before seen, even garnering Hollywood's adoration with the film Zero Dark Thirty. But in other instances, in fact, more common than not, these soldiers are sent on deployments in the role of military advisors. Now we've seen that not too long ago in the summer of 2014 with the U.S. military having to go back in and retrain Iraqi forces. And right now, we're seeing that again with policymakers earmarking $19 million to help build the Ukrainian National Guard troops. Soon we'll be seeing American soldiers in Ukraine near the Polish border teaching and training the Ukrainian troops. It's worth noting that the mission statement for the SOF specifically states the following, to provide fully capable special operations forces to defend the United States and its interests, synchronized planning of global operations against terrorist networks. Well, before 9-11, SOCOM's primary focus was to support command missions of their various SOF teams, 
who would be deployed to assist U.S. ambassadors and their respective countries. But by 2004, during the Bush administration, the DOD and the Unified Command Plan expanded their responsibilities to include the role of fighting global terror networks, which now might leave many wondering. Why is the U.S. utilizing these commandos in advisory roles in places such as Ukraine, while there's civilian bloodshed in places where terror groups like Boko Haram are killing entire villages by the thousands? In Washington, Manila Chan, RT. RT is based in the United States. It's not coming from Russia. But anyway, uh, okay, you've heard me just say offhand many times, many times, you've heard me say about the United States creating Al-Qaeda and creating ISIS and IL and everything else that they call it. Uh, and I've referred to it as being exactly analogous to the glass company owner who hires local juvenile delinquents to run around at nighttime breaking windows by throwing rocks through them so that those people will come in and buy new windows the next morning. Uh, that's what we use Al-Qaeda and ISIS for. We hire them to go and break the windows all around the world, and then we go and <laughs> put in new windows. The only thing is, we're the only ones that get to look out those windows. Well, anyway, we stretched that analogy too much. Uh, but here's a little bit of proof. Every once in a while, something services in the media. This is a story about an ISIS leader getting funded by the U.S. In Pakistan, say a local commander from the terrorist network Islamic State has admitted receiving funds transferred via the U.S. He made the confession while being interrogated. Artiz Ganeshichkan has the story. The Pakistani police arrested an ISIS commander, Yusuf al Salafi, and sources told Pakistan's Express Tribune that the commander confessed to receiving funds routed through the United States to recruit young people to fight in Syria. Al Salafi reportedly said he received around $600 dollars for every recruit he sent to Syria and that he was working with the support of an imam. The paper quotes one source saying the U.S. has been condemning the Islamic State activities but unfortunately has not been able to stop the funding of these organizations which is being routed through the U.S. This report raises so many questions. First of all, is Al Salafi telling the truth? If he is, does this make U.S. banks complicit in funding terrorists? And another one, were U.S. authorities aware of this? It's no secret that he, just a little over a year ago, fighting ISIS was not a priority for the U.S. Washington was focused on trying to remove Bashar Assad from power. We now hear that President Obama will ask Congress for $5.3 billion to equip and train Iraqi soldiers and quote-unquote moderate Syrian rebels to fight the Islamic State militants. Over the past few years, Washington has been much criticized for not having a good idea about who exactly is doing the fighting on the side of the opposition in Syria. And many are now concerned that some part of this new package of funding and weapons could end up in the hands of ISIS. Okay, now coming back to local issues, I just want to touch on this real briefly. Uh, we did a show uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact, on a growing concern with Jim Lockhart. We did a show call or, uh, on the subject of the Nestle Company wanting to move into uh, East Portland or Gresham, whatever, and they want us, now we defeated this before, they wanted us to give them our pure, pristine Bull Run water so that they could bottle it and sell it all over the world. Apparently they've run India dry, so they need another source. But anyway, uh, it, <laughs> it's, it's absolutely amazing. In order for us to do them that service, give them our free water, that would leave us with a water shortage and we'd have to sink five wells next to the Clackamas River and the associated bureaucracy and uh, purification plant that would be necessary so that that water would be drinkable. That would only cost us taxpayers $100 million so that Nestle can make a profit on our water. Wouldn't that be a good way to do it? Just think of it that way. So get off your butts and make sure that doesn't happen. All right. Now we've got another problem. They just approved the Keystone Pipeline. Well, here's a story that's not from Russia Today. This one's from the Real News Network in Boston. Let's listen to this one and I'll be back just before we go off the air. 
Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Jessica Devereaux in Baltimore. On Thursday, the Senate passed the bill getting the Keystone XL pipeline closer to becoming a reality. During their three-week-long amendment marathon, there were some pipeline disasters, leaving many people questioning the safety and environmental impact of this cross-country pipeline. Take a look at some of this footage captured on Monday in West Virginia, where an oil pipeline exploded. Now joining us to discuss pipelines and politics are our two guests. Joining us from Madison, Wisconsin, is Steve Horn. Steve is a research fellow for DSmog Blog and a freelance investigative journalist. Also joining us is Sam Schobacher. He is the Western Region Director for Food and Water Watch. Thank you both, both for joining us. So Sam, let's start off with you. As I mentioned, there were two oil pipeline disasters, one in West Virginia, the other actually was in Montana. What, what is the, the impact of these types of um, oil pipeline disasters and what is the rate of occurrence that these things actually happen? These pipeline disasters are emblematic of the inherent dangers associated with fossil fuel and oil and gas development in the United States. Although the Keystone XL pipeline is perhaps the most infamous of all of the pipelines that come up in the news regularly, there are a myriad of pipelines crisscrossing the United States in a spider's web of dangerous industrial activity that are really being pushed forward by the fracking industry and the fracking boom in the United States. So, for example, um, there's a proposed pipeline that would go through sensitive ranching and farming community to take Bakken oil that's been fracked from North Dakota through Illinois to Iowa. There's a proposal to take um, fracked oil and gas uh, through BLM land next to Chaco Canyon, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site in New Mexico. There are proposals to take pipelines to export oil and gas that has been fracked along the coast of Oregon. And what we're seeing is that across the board, these pipelines, they fail, they leak, they contaminate drinking water, which is what happened to the community in Glendive. They imperil worker safety. They contaminate pristine waterways. And they really endanger so much of the important things in many of these communities across the United States. Sam, do you have like a percentage? What rate of occurrence do these type of accidents occur? I don't have a percentage offhand, but as we're seeing, they are more and more common as we are increasingly putting in hundreds if not thousands of miles of pipeline to transport this dirty and dangerous fracked oil and gas across the United States. All right, let's dig a little deeper and talk about the amendments that were proposed. There were 18 that actually got voted on and 16, I'm sorry, and six passed. Steve, tell us about this petroleum coke or pet coke as some people call it, amendment that was proposed by two Michigan senators. Why was it so significant? Well, that, you know, that amendment was significant because petroleum coke or pet coke is a byproduct of producing and refining the tar sands. And so, uh, you know, one of the, sen the original senator bringing this up to the floor was actually Dick Durbin in Illinois. And also the other one uh, in Michigan was Gary Peters. Both of them have seen the impacts of petroleum coke, Gary Peters in Detroit, and uh, you know, Dick Durbin on the south side of Chicago, both in working class areas that don't uh, that basically have become sacrifice zones for pet coke. Pet coke is kind of like coal dust, except it's even more fine, uh, you know, fine grained. And uh, if you breathe it in, uh, there's all kinds of impacts that are still unknown, uh, understudied because tar sands is still pretty new, and pet coke is is definitely something that uh, you know health you know, health experts still need to study. But early indications show that it's definitely not safe to breathe in. Um, there's class action lawsuits right now in Chicago over the fact that uh, the Coke, Coke Industries owns a huge pile there that they refuse to even cover. That's what the lawsuit is about. It's not even stopping Pet Coke from being stored there. It's just that when they store it, they refuse to even pay for something to cover up the Pet Coke. And so what this amendment would have done is said, look, when you transport this Pet Coke around the country, you being the oil industry, uh, it needs to be covered. And uh, this amendment didn't pass. And like in Chicago, it's taking, uh, it's kind of symbolic of what's happening in Chicago right now. Uh, it's taking, it's, it's now taken a couple of years to, to move this along and, and still stalling in Chicago. And so a couple of years later, after it became an issue, it's still in city council, and it may be years until the stuff is even covered up. And it's already happened once in California. And what I'll say, you know, if you look at the Senate level, uh, 
Mary Landrew was one of the people who took this, was instrumental in taking this off the floor, the head of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee and the Senate. Well, one of her former chief of staffs uh, is, until recently, was uh, the head lobbyist for Oxbow Carbon, which is owned by Bill Koch, the brother of David and Charles Koch. And they, uh, they are one of the biggest marketers of pet Koch in the world. So uh, you see the revolving door in action. You see how important this pet Coke is as a byproduct. Uh, they don't even want to pay to cover it up, but uh, after it's, uh, it would be an expense that they don't want to pay for, then when it will be moved to market and shipped um, predominantly to uh, Asia and China. All right, let's move on and talk about another amendment. Uh, Senator Ted Cruz, senator from Texas, he also had an amendment about oil exports and the LNG um, amendment, so to speak. What did that actually entail and did it pass, Sam? So this was an amendment that was proposed to lift the uh, longstanding historical ban on crude oil exports that the United States has maintained for several decades. Um, Steve, you should weigh in on to whether the amendment passed, but the impact of this will be pretty dire in a couple of ways. Um, first and foremost, this would be a sweetheart giveaway to the oil and gas industry. A lot of people in the industry have been salivating over the prospect of getting to take the fracked oil that has been increasingly in abundance in the United States and ship it overseas to countries like China or India or, or, or continents like Europe. And we can be certain that if this bill goes forward to fast track the export of oil, fracked oil, or even fracked natural gas, we're going to see thousands more fracking wells next to homes and schools, as we have seen in Texas in New Mexico, in Pennsylvania, in my home state of Colorado. The second concern is, of course, if you start exporting this resource overseas, there's a question of what that will do to the cost of getting that resource in the United States. For many consumers, folks that are working, that are just barely able to make ends meet, the prospect of seeing their, their home heating costs go up because of this export bill, that's not a, that's not a satisfactory one. That's not one that they're looking and excited to have to add to the long list of costs that they're already trying to, to take and make ends meet with. So we're really concerned about this. And I think, if anything, this shows that this push to export oil is not about energy independence. It's about trying to line the pockets of a few of the wealthiest oil and gas companies and their friends in Congress and the U.S. Senate are only so happy to help them do that. Yeah, and the, this bill, uh, this amendment did not did not pass. But there's two things to note. One, uh, another bill while the Keystone XL was being debated in the Senate passed in the House to expedite permitting for liquefied natural gas exports, and this will be brought to the Senate later on this year. Uh, Mary Landrieu has already announced that she will be bringing it to the floor. So it's only a matter of months until the Senate begins debating whether or not. To make this a reality. Second of all, uh, although that amendment did not pass, mostly because Ted Cruz, uh, some some Republicans decided, you know, do not think that uh, doing what Ted Cruz thought was politically smart it is smart because the industry doesn't want 100% uh, all-out exports right now, mostly due to the you know concerns about the price of oil. That said, the industry has quietly, through uh, the Obama Department of Commerce gotten permits to export condensate, oil condensate, and they're allowed to do something called self-classify, which is they have the say over whether or not this is actually condensate or not. And we really don't know how much oil is being exported as condensate, but there's been really influential rulings by the Department of Com Commerce that have happened since the middle of 2014 through today. Companies like Shell are now exporting condensate, uh, enterprise products, uh, and, and, and several others. Uh, we don't even know the extent of it. But this is something that uh, the, president, the Obama administration announced on New Year's Eve going into the new year. So uh, although that amendment did not pass in the Senate, uh, it doesn't mean that exports of some sort of oil, uh, meaning condensate right now, according to their self-classification, is not happening. It definitely is, and it is increasingly so. Speaking of amendments that didn't pass, there was also an amendment to close the so-called Halliburton loophole. Steve, can you just talk about that a little bit? What is that loophole, and, and, and why didn't it pass? Well, Senator Gillibrand in New York, the Democrat, 
she brought this to the floor uh, to close what is called the Halliburton loophole. That is a loophole that exempts the oil and gas industry when it does fracking from regulations under the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, and, uh, and other key things that would protect uh, Americans drinking water uh, when fracking happens. This was uh, a clause in the Energy Policy Act of 2005, and there's been something called the Frack Act, which has been introduced uh, several occasions, has never passed. And so what Gillibrand decided to do was try to get it through as an amendment in this Keystone XL bill. It did not pass. And um, obviously, the, you know, I don't think that the fracking industry could exist at all if these things were regulated because it really proves they can't do fracking without contaminating water or uh, threatening people's drinking water. And so it's just a night. I think that the fact that this amendment lost is just more proof that you know, fracking is dangerous. And it's, it's a tacit admission by the United States Senate uh, and politicians funded by the oil and gas industry that it cannot be done safely. All right, Steve. Think, oh, jump in right qu quick, Sam. Well, I was just going to say, I think that just to pick up where Steve left off, the failure of this amendment demonstrates the power of the oil and gas industry and the influence they have on our elected officials at the highest level in the United States. I think it is really telling in a state like Colorado, where we have over 52,000 active fracking wells, many of which are you know located 500 feet from homes and schools and public reservoirs. The only reason that this is allowed to go forward in large part is because of this exemption and yet there are still Democratic senators like Senator Bennett, who unfortunately decided that it was more important to protect the interests of the oil and gas industry than his constituents. So I, I anticipate we're going to see a lot more of these conversations with the new Congress and the oil and gas industry attempting to flex their muscle to kill anything that they don't like and put forward many more proposals to penalize communities that are attempting to protect themselves from this dangerous industrial activity. All right, Steve, final question. You recently wrote about another approval of a tar sands crude pipeline owned by Enbridge. It, it sort of went under the radar because it got approved on January 16th in the shadow of this Keystone XL pipeline debate. Just quickly, give us an update on, on what actually happened. So this was Enbridge Line 78. It runs from uh, north central Illinois in the Flanagan Illinois area, uh, eastward towards the Chicagoland area uh, to, the, to uh, Griffith, Indiana, which is very close to the BP Whiting Refinery. Same area around which that pet coke is piling up uh, in, this, in Chicagoland on the south side. And the long story short is that this was approved via something called a nationwide permit 12 through the United States Army Corps of Engineers. And it's not the first one that they've done. Uh, they've also permitted uh, the Flanagan South Pipeline, which is owned by Enbridge, which runs from Flanagan, Illinois, down to Cushing, Oklahoma. And they've also permitted the uh, Keystone XL Southern half, which is from Cushing, Oklahoma, down again to the Gulf. And so the three of these pipelines, uh, first of all, if you look at Enbridge's system that's going southward, it's created what I've called a Keystone XL clone. It does the exact same thing as the Keystone Pipeline system. It brings that tar sands all the way down to the Gulf to, for the very same purpose, to feed into those Gulf refinery markets, also potentially for the global export market. But what, what, why this seven, Line 78 is important is not only because it has the capacity of up to 800,000 barrels per day, but because it's a key piece of infrastructure that now I think is sort of a clone of what TransCanada is trying to create in Canada, something called the Energy East Pipeline. Enbridge, again, like they've done with their South, Word pipelines has created piece by piece uh, something that will bring uh, tar sands now eastward. Uh, although TransCanada has made the, the you know, a tactical, I would say, an error almost in doing one you know, grand pipeline project. What Enbridge has done is done it piece by piece, pipelines that connect to one another. And this is just another example. Why why is this nationwide permit twelve important? Uh, well, it, basically, there was no public input on this at all. It usurps. Uh, the National Environmental Policy Act process, the NEPA process. And so unlike the Keystone XL, which has received robust debate in the past several years, including now two weeks of debate again uh, in the Senate, this pipeline received no public hearings, no public debate at all. And the United States Army Corps of Engineers permitted it under the radar 10 days into the opening of the debate of Senate Bill 1 to approve the Keystone XL pipeline. All right, Steve Horn and Sam Schobacher, thank you That's both. That's how they're trying to implement uh, all kinds of things, you know, just keep it absolute secret 
go ahead and sign it. It's like the, uh, the formation of, of one big country out of North America. We've already done it. It's already done. The president of Mexico, the president of the United States, and uh, who prime minister of Canada all signed the deal. It's a done deal. I don't understand why they haven't, you know, really used that yet. They're trying to. Well, anyway, uh, in this time and age, uh, how many times have you gotten on face not Facebook, but on YouTube or somewhere and seen something that is so incredible you, you don't think it's real? You wish somebody might you know, verify these things first? Well, Facebook figured out a way to censor you while giving you the impression that you're taking care of stuff like that. of our current culture. We all know this, right? We love it, we hate it, and then everyone just feels bad about the whole thing. Because there's so much to feel bad about with Facebook. So here's something new to feel bad about with Facebook. Because Facebook just wrote a post on its newsroom blog entitled, Newsfeed FYI, showing fewer hoaxes. In it, Facebook details a new plan to reduce the distribution of posts that people have reported as hoaxes. Recently, the site added a feature where you can flag another person's post as a false news story. There's no qualification for that. It's just some random person seeing a post about some news that they think sounds false and click, they've officially reported it as false news. Facebook said it added the option to cut down on news hoaxes. The example headlines they give for such hoaxes are man sees dinosaur on hike in Utah and scientists demonstrate irrefutably the existence of Santa Claus. You know, the totally unbelievable made up crap that people post all the time to Facebook. They're so outrageous sounding that people immediately want to share them, adding to the awful cacophony that is Facebook. So through this new algorithm by Facebook, posts that get flagged as false news stories often will get reduced distribution in the Facebook news feed. It doesn't say exactly how they're going to reduce that distribution. It just says that posts deemed false news by other users won't be distributed as much as they normally would. So the horrible noise on Facebook will get slightly muted. At least that's their plan. But here's the thing. Just because a news story sounds too fantastic to be true doesn't make it false. And usually the true stories that sound the most false are the ones that aren't reported by the mainstream media. If it's from CNN or Fox or any other big outlet, it's just taken as true. No one's going to flag that. But news from alternate sources, people are more likely to flag that. So now this new algorithm is making Facebook and its legion of users the arbiters of truth, deciding what news stories should be spread far and wide. I didn't think Facebook could get any worse, and yet somehow it always does. Tonight, let's talk about that. Okay, see you next Saturday, first, first show in February.